which is a new columnar engine um, for the Hadoop ecosystem. So first of all, I'd like to start by talking about why did we build this new thing, right? Uh, why didn't we just use whatever was there before? So <coughs> three years ago, uh, a group of us got together at Cloudera and we basically started thinking if there were a group of problems that we couldn't address because gaps in the current uh, in current storage technology in the Adobe ecosystem. Um, and how could we position ourselves to take advantage of the advancements that were to come in the next few years in the, in the hardware landscape? So one of the things, one of the obvious things, and you see here, you can see here this graph, which is a very qualitative graph. We call it an MBA graph because it doesn't need, actually measure anything but on, on one side of the graph, if you want fast random access, you have Apache HBase. It's it's very good at that. It's very good at at storing uh, at storing your data with very low latency <coughs> and make, making it immedi immediately available for point lookups. On the other hand, you have you have you have your you have HDFS with Parquet, which is very good at scanning a lot of data with high throughput. But if you want both, in, if you want both in, at the same time, if you want if you want consistent storage that allows for point lookups and has um, Parquet or HDFS uh, type scan scannabilities, then there's something missing there. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we this is the the hardware landscape change that I was talking about, right? So. We have, we have a migration from spinning disk to solid, solid state storage. And then flash, it's faster than ever, with higher throughput uh, than ever. And we have new Intel technologies like 3D, 3D Crosspoint, which are basically going to boost that a thousand fold. Um, and on the other, even RAM itself is getting cheaper and cheaper, and servers in places like Amazon EC2 and data centers are getting more and more out. So the two takeaways of this is, is that uh, are that like column stores, which traditionally need to access a bunch of different columns for point lookups. So if you have a spinning disk, it, this means accessing different points of the disk for each lookup, which, are, which is slow in spinning disks, but not so slow uh, on SSDs anymore. And it, this also means Another takeaway from this is that because memory is getting faster and faster, uh, the next bottleneck is actually CPU. So we need to position ourselves to be able to take advantage of the CPU the most that we can to keep it, to keeping it fed, right? And that's where that, that's where Kudu comes in. Uh, so Kudu is supposed supposed to be almost as fast as HDFS with Parquet for for large scans. It's a, it's supposed to be at almost as good as HBase uh, for point lookups and low latency, low, low latency writes, um, and at the same time provide a relational data model that people are already familiar with, and you have a NoSQL style scan insert of the API. When I say NoSQL style, I just mean that if you're familiar with Cassandra's APIs, but mostly HBase's API, then you'll be, you'll be familiar with, with Kudu's API right off the bat. Um, if we view this in terms of the functionality, uh, where Kudu comes in is where you have your structured fixed column data in HDFS, i.e. Parquet, but that needs updates, or if you're using something like HBase um, for, for structured fixed column data, right? Which is not, none of these are, none of these systems were designed to actually handle this case. So, Kudu usage, uh, each table has a SQLite scheme, uh, schema with a finite number of columns uh, with all the types that you're familiar with. Some subset of those columns, right now it needs to be a prefix, some prefix of, that, of those columns is going to form your primary key. Uh, we have very, fa very fast alter table uh, that doesn't actually rewrite all of the data across 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 all the clusters, so it takes seconds, not hours or minutes. Uh, and we have integrations with MapReduce and Spark and Impala and more to come. 
So the, keys, the use cases are we are you're targeting, we are aiming for are those use cases where you have huge, we have constant and very big scans, and some inserts, and a few updates. And we'll, we'll see why, why I say a few updates in a bit. So time series, storage of time series are basically constantly appending, maybe, maybe updating some data that just arrived, but mostly you're just appending and then like scanning that data to, 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 to derive some, some conclusions, performing some analytics. Machine data analytics, storing sensor data, running machine learning on top of it, stuff like that, <coughs> online reporting, etc. So this is your traditional current pipeline to address these, these cases. People, so that is produced by some systems, it's sensors or something like that. Um, we start in NH base because it's not very practical to keep storing everything in Parquet, for instance. You start in NH base, and every so often you go, you basically do a full table scan of H base. You 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 wrench it you wrench it into neat Parquet files, column R Parquet files. You put them on HDFS. And then you 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 run you run your queries your analytical queries your machine learning queries on HDFS. There are a bunch of problems with this, right? For, first of all, the pipeline is complex. Um, how do we handle failures? How do we handle correctness in the middle of all this? Um, uh, another thing is like maintenance. It's it's hard to to maintain. Uh, and finally, there's there's a latency between the the moment that data is invested. <coughs> in the moment that data is available for analytics or machine learning or whatever. And this is how where Kudu comes into play. So you basically ingest directly into Kudu, right? And you can run your reports and, and machine learning and whatever workload you want to run off of that directly. There are no ground jobs or no, no background processes. It already ha handles late arrivals of data correction with these. And new data is, is immediately available for analytics and operations. So let's see a bit how it works. I'll, I will try and focus more on the, on the, on the storage internals and just briefly, briefly go over the distribution part. So each table is horizontally partitioned into tablets. Uh, if you're familiar with HPAs, these would be your H regions. And you can use range or hash partitioning. Uh, basically, the, it's something that people already used for edge base for, for a long time. We just embedded that. We just baked that in. Uh, I'm talking about edge partitioning. We just baked, baked that in into the client. Um, each tablet has three or five replicas, and we do the replication through consensus. Uh, and this means that uh, this is not eventually consistent. This is fully consistent. Actually, our target. Uh, <coughs> Build desperation at this point because we're not quite there. We still have some edges, to, uh, rough edges, but our target is strict serializability. So, which is like the most consistent that you can be. Um, tablet servers host multiple tablets and they store data on local disk, not HDFS. So, uh, each tablet server did the thing that I was just described, it stored a bunch of these tablets that I was just describing. And then you have a replicated master that acts as a tablet directory itself, stores, stores data and maintains stuff, consi maintains uh, data consistent through, through the same algorithms that tablet, ta tablet, tablet servers, tablets use. It acts as a catalog and as a load balancer, um, and it caches all the metadata in RAM. Uh, we've had thousand node clusters running off of a single master machine. Uh, we're working uh, on master HA right now, which is kind of in, pro in, in progress. Uh, and basically, we can serve all the metadata from memory with microsecond latencies. So this is how the layout of the cluster looks, right? So you have the master tablet. We have multiple masters. The master tablet is replicated across multiple masters. And then for each tablet, we have each tablet is replicated uh, across multiple tablet servers and served by those tablet servers. And basically, writes go to the leader. The leader is the is the is the responsible for handling all writes. But reads can come from followers. So, just a brief overview of how consensus works and how how we use it. 
Then it comes in from the client. The client requests a, a write RPC to the leader. The leader writes to its local wall and calls update consensus on all the replicas. Each, each of the replicas writes to, it, to their local wall and, and reply to the leader of success. And as soon as a majority has been achieved, the leader deems the write successful and committed and can, and can now be replied to the client. This write is now guaranteed to survive any minority failures. Um, one, one interesting thing here uh, that probably are all, most of you are probably already familiar with consi from consistency algorithms is that uh, you don't even need the leader to actually write to its local wall. As long as the majority writes to the wall, um, the write is considered committed, which means that even if the leader itself is, is I.O. bound for some other reason because it's running some maintenance task, the write can still, uh, we still ha have the ability to basically level those latencies. Uh, then the leader replies to the client, success, and the client, uh, the, the right is considered committed and visible to everyone else. So, fault tolerance is pretty traditional again. Trans tra transient follower failures, the leader can still achieve majority. Most of the clients won't, won't even notice. Um, if, if the follower restarts within, within Five minutes, it will rejoin the re rejoin the, the, the configuration, the consistent configuration automatically, um, with no with no external work needed. Uh, if the the leader itself fails, uh, and because the leader is heart beating to replicas, uh, the replicas will detect that the leader is missing, uh, and they will trigger the leader, the leader election. Each one of them will try to get them get get itself elected. And once, once, once they reach consensus on who the new leader is, rights progress as normal. As normal. Um, this usually happens within a very a few seconds. Our beats are like are configurable. Usually, every 0 0.5 seconds, which means like every uh, the cluster can recover with 1.5 to 2 seconds um, uh, MTTR in uh, in the in the general case. And if the leader itself, if, if the node that was the leader rejoins the cluster within five, mi five minutes, it rejoins as a follower. And again, no external uh, action is needed for it to continue to operate. If there's a permanent failure, if a node just goes away, um, the leader notices that a follower has been dead for five minutes. And it, the, the, that follower is basically evicted from the consensus configuration. Um, the master will select a new replica. And that re replica will start remote bootstrapping from the current leader, and it will rejoin the will rejoin the consensus configuration as a replica, and start serving reads. reads. And now I'm going to talk a bit about the engine internals, and how, what makes this different from other things you might know. Uh, so, inserts are buffered in, in an in-memory store, like HVS mem store. And they are, but they are flushed to this in columnar layout. Each 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 uh, each column is is flushed in a, in a in a neat columnar file that can be compressed and encoded. So it takes less space in this on this. Uh, updates use MVCC multi-version <coughs> concurrency control, which is a database technique. And one 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 it happened. Uh, and one thing, uh, Advent uses multi-version concurrency control, which is a database technique. And one important feature here is that we, we allow selective as of timestamps. So you basically can query arbitrarily in the past, and you're guaranteed to always get a repeatable read, which is fully consistent. Um, and we have a near optimal path for current time scans. So if you're basically uh, Querying the data at the latest timestamp, you're guaranteed to have the fastest read path that we can that we, that we can get for you. There's no Perl branches. That we have fast vectorized decoding and predicate evaluation, and but performance does worsen with the number of recent uh, updates. And we'll we'll see why that's that's the case in a minute. In a minute. So if you compare Kudu to the to the traditional LSM LSM um, block structure merged trees. That, that we, which which 
are how HBase and, uh, and Cassandra work internally, we'll see some differences. So on, an LS, on the LSM insert path, you have an insert, it comes into the BAM store, it's also written, written into a wall somewhere, which I'm, I'm omitting, we do, we do that all the time. Uh, so you have a neat, and then it gets flushed this to an H file, right? We have a new insert, again, comes into the mem store. Uh, this, sh this should be row two, but um, that, was, that was actually my mistake. But eventually it gets also flushed into, into another H file. So if, you, if we initially have an update to row two, we now have row two in two places, and if we need to scan all the data, or if we just want to scan row two, we need to get it. We need to get all. We need to read from all the H files to make sure that we have that we merge the data together. For instance, in this case, if we wanted to read row two, we need to, we need an H file, an H file two, and, and the mem store. This merge happens by its, uh, string row key comparison. String comparison, as you know, is expensive. It's expensive. Um, and it means that if you're doing large scans, you're doing this for every single key that you do, right? So not only are you, are you merging data from all these files, sorting it, and you're also comparing all, 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 all the string keys, which makes which is why large scale scans on HBase are or Cassandra, or at least traditional Cassandra, are slow. So how does this work in Kudu? How are the, are we different? Um, we have an insert, it goes into the memory set, exactly like in HBase, but when we flush, we flush to these neat, neat little columnar files, right? Uh, where each file keeps only the data for its column. Additionally, so we say we have another insert, it goes into another file, but the difference here is that we have an additional mem store. Each row exists in, in exactly one disk row set. So there's no merging needed when we read, and if we want to update that row, then each disk row set has a delta mem store for that. So each updates to the rows that are present in a disk row set go into the delta mem store. That's contrary to HBase, where they would go to the memory set again. And we'll see why, why, why that, how that works. So we, we have we have an update. Uh, we check we check the bloom filter. Bloom filter says no. We check the bloom filter again. Bloom filter says maybe. So we go actually look for the key on, in the index, and we find it, and we store the update on uh, on the on the Delta mem store. So if we need to read rows from this row set two, uh, if we need to read all the rows, we read the rows from this row set two, and then we read the rows from this row set one. There, any row is only read once, and there's no need to merge them, right? There's no not not only do we not do string comparison, we don't need to do any comparison uh, comparison at all to just read the rows. If we need to apply the updates, if we say that we need to apply this update to uh, Alice, in this case, we do need to have a way to match them. But instead of, instead of storing the updates <coughs> per row key, we use an, an ordinal, right? And because you're, 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 you're looking for a number instead of comparing keys, it's again much faster. Of course, you might be wondering what happens if you have a lot of these updates, then you get slow, and that's why this is mostly geared for inserts with some updates. Um, but if you're co constantly updating the same rows, it won't be as fast as it could. These delta mem stores themselves eventually get flushed into what we call a redo delta file that basically allows you to advance the state of the base data into however however it needs to go to to the present. Um, Another, another, another important, uh, another problem that we need that, that we need to solve is that that of compaction. So, those of you familiar with Cassandra and HBase know that there's usually a period that needs to happen somewhere where major compaction will run and basically screw screw the AO all over. Um, that's problematic, of course, and we try to address that from the get go. And we our our, our idea is the following. So. The problem is that you have all these row sets that are overlapping in key space. So if you want to do a neat, if you want to do a write, you need you probably need to look in all of them, right? Which is not good. So what we'd like to have them is how we like to have them is neatly separated, neatly separated in a 
in a in key space so that they don't overlap. And this is pretty much what the convection problem is all about. What we do differently though is that instead of having one major convection, we 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 do what we call a budgeted convection. We have a maintenance thread that is given a budget, say 128 megabytes. And what we will do, it, it will solve an optimization problem, which is actually a, a NAPSAC problem, and it will try and find the best set of row sets to spend those 128 megabytes on. It, it will basically look pretty much all over for, for that ide ideal set, score them, get the best, do the compaction, and this, this is continuously running. So this is continuously happening in your cluster and you don't have to have that period during the night where it's going to have, it's going to run the, the, your major compaction. The key to trade-offs are of course that uh, random updates are going to be slower. And single row reads <laughs> may be slower than compared to h -base. So let's go over some benchmarks real quick. Uh, so these are our analytical benchmarks, uh, they're TPC, TPCH, uh, scale, scale factor 100, um, and here we're comparing Kudu to Parquet, where Parquet is blue and Kudu is red. So our goal from the get-go is to be within 20 to 30 percent of Parquet, um, because Parquet can do big I.O. and we, we're doing more stuff, so we're expecting to be slower, uh, but in this case, in this specific uh, scale factor, we're actually 20 percent faster. Um, uh, so we see that Kudu outperforms Parquet by 31% in this specific case, that probably is not in all cases. Uh, and, but Parquet, Parquet is likely to outperform Kudu for HDD resident um, data. Here we compared Kudu to HBase. Um, we ran YCSB, and what you can see is that if you have a uniform workload, HBase is better. We're, we're not too far behind um, in, in terms of throughput. However, if you have a Zipfian workload where some of the rows are getting most of the updates, then we get slow, and that's and that's why if you're just like doing point lookups and writing and likely writing a lot or likely writing a lot of time to the same row, you might still want to use HBase. And I'm going to just show real quick a case that we already have some a customer. They are not really a customer because not they're not paying us. They just uh, using it for, 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 for this use case, which is Xiaomi. Uh, they already have a 200, 200, I think it's 200. I know that we have, we have a new case where, where it's 200 cluster, but it, maybe this, this one's uh, kind of had that. And they had to use, they used to have this long pipeline where they have data sources, they store some of it to HBase, and then they have this, ET, they have this ETL lateral pipeline and then they crash it with Hive and MapReduce and Spark. <coughs> some, of it, some of it gets stored to Parquet, and basically when, when results are served uh, either through these jobs or through Parquet and Impala or even from, from HBase itself. And it has a high latency of one hour to one day between the moment that data gets into the system from the, to the moment that data can be queried. Uh, and there's no ordering, right? And how they solved it is basically they store all the data in Kudu, which is what I was uh, talking about initially. You basically do direct data ingestion if you st still have back pressure, uh, ha you might still have back pressure handling ATL that also lands in Kudu. And then basically you do your point lookups and scan and, and, um, and the lab queries uh, from Kudu also. This is uh, a benchmark that they ran, uh, which has which has a mix of analytical and point lookups. Uh, they compared Kudu to Parquet, and again, in their case, we came up, we came up a little bit faster. Uh, this is our website. We're just we're currently incubating uh, on the Apache Foundation. You can find us here. There are links for all kinds of stuff, like mailing lists and documentation and papers. If you like to read papers, there's at least a couple of paper, interesting papers there. And of course, we're hiring. Thank you, David, for the interesting presentation. There's a mic in the center. Or I can come by if anybody has questions towards the end of the room. I think we have a question. Hi, Mike. So the question is, 
on like uh, how do we store this past data in the Kudu? And then second question is on like how do we compare the Kudu with the Phoenix? With Phoenix. Phoenix. Oh, right. Uh, so first question. Uh, so Kudu can store your sparse data as long as you know the schema. I mean, you can have hundreds or even uh, on the low thousands of columns, um, and they're, they're, it's still stored efficiently because you basically don't store the new, the null values. Um, so it handles it handles that pretty well. But you still need to know the schema. So you can't do like you, you do in HBraser and just come up with a new column name uh, because that, that would be uh, schema free. The second question. Uh, I actually had a slide for that, which I had to remove. Uh, but the gist of it is that we're pretty, pretty we're, little, we're faster, uh, quite a bit faster, 30 to 50 percent faster for all app queries, and we're slower for point lookup queries. Thank you. Um, Kudu is using its own duplication scheme, and uh, what the trade-off between using the Hattie uh, uh, HTML file system or your own duplication? So there, there, there are multiple reasons for that. Uh, one of them is uh, we wanted a very, very low MTTR, and we also wanted uh, to be to, to to make replica replicas useful, right? So for instance, in, in, in a, so for instance in HBase, what you have is that you have a node that is responsible for a tablet, and yes, that is replicated in in, in HDFS. There was a program in HDFS, but that node is user, is responsible for all the reads from that uh, from that from that particular setup from that data set uh, from that from that region. Uh, what we wanted to do is first of all have a very low MDTR where a new leader comes up almost momentarily, talking about two seconds, and for that you cannot use that scheme. And the second and the second point is replicas in this case are, are actually useful. So if you have if you have an Impala cluster that's running multiple queries on top of it. Some of the queries will hit a replica and some of the queries will hit another replica. So they will not uh, basically get queued one behind the other. We'll take that as the last question uh, before we close this. Episode. So uh, is it possible to store any kind of objects that we want in uh, Kudo or are we restricted to primary data? Uh, we do have we do we do allow for strings, but you lose something in the process. It's not a blob store. Uh, it's not supposed to to be used to store images. Uh, we do we have dictionary encoding, so we're actually pretty efficient to store yeah. strings. And we can store blobs. It's just that they're they're not going to be as advantageous regarding our architecture as other types of would be. Thank you. Thank you, David.